morning. Good morning. Yeah, we got to do that again. It's Friday. Good morning. That's, that's it. That's good. You're all awake now. Um, I'm Amanda McMullen. I'm the president and CEO here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And it's an absolute delight to welcome you to an extraordinary day of learning. Um, I am here simply to welcome you to the museum, but I cannot escape this room without thanking Lee Blake, Kim Walker. Please give them a round of applause. I think it was, let's see, Tim, was it 2019 when you and Lee, right? And Pia, you might have been, were you, yeah, we were all in a meeting and you sort of said, I'm working on a really cool publication. I've got some interesting scholarship. And Lee said, we want to partner with you and have it at the Whaling Museum when it becomes an exhibit. And I just want to call out and thank the two of you and your organizations for being such extraordinary partners for bringing this opportunity to the museum and seeing the museum as sort of a vessel, if you will, all pun intended, to be the space that we could tell this story on a larger scale. So know how grateful we are, I am, for your partnership. Um, and I simply want to wish you a wonderful day of learning and discovery, um, a powerful day, I have no doubt. I also wanted to let you know that in my hand is a stack of come back to the museum passes, if you will. I will leave them at the table. If we run out, people know where to find me to get more and our team. We encourage you to come back to the museum, explore this exhibit more deeply, but explore and enjoy the museum. So thank you so much for being here and enjoy your day. Thank you. It is a wonderful Friday and it's wonderful to see you all here this morning, early, here, ready to be on time for the whole day. So I'm grateful to be able to share the Sailing to Freedom Maritime Dimensions of the Underground Railroad with you. Tim and I have been working on this for 14, 15 years. However, the New Bedford Historical Society has been working on this for 27 years. So let's get a round of applause. This conference and this exhibit comes at a crucial time in our history in the U.S. when we have people who want to stop the teaching of African American and multicultural history in schools across the country because it makes people feel bad. Well, what about the people that were oppressed? Did they feel bad? And don't we learn from some of the problems that people have worked together, both black and white, Native American, Cape Verdean, we've worked together to solve some of those problems. So you need to know the background. So we will continue teaching this history. As Tim mentioned, we've been working together for 14 years or so. The uh, New Bedford Historical Society has a group of really dedicated, we're all volunteer, grassroots people who have been saving buildings that are important to African Americans and Cape Britians in New Bedford. When you walk around, you'll see murals of people of color. That is us. We raise the money, we come up with the vision, but we slowly have changed the uh, vision of the city and to make sure that the history of the city that is promoted is multicultural. And I know many of you appreciate our work as you mention it all the time. The Society is the oldest New Bedford organization founded to research and present community programs about the contributions of people of color. We preserve, as I mentioned, the heritage of African Americans, Cape Verdeans, American Indians, West Indians, and other people of color. And as you look around the room, you'll see some of our ancestors. And I, I'm looking at Amos Haskins in the back, who is a Wampanoag, uh, Wheeler. So you'll see those pictures and many families have donated that information here to the Whaling Museum and, and we work with them to help present those things. In presenting Sailing to Freedom, we tell the stories of city residents who sheltered freedom seekers 
and provided sanctuary on our docks, in our homes, and on whaling crews in the 19th century. In our research, we have found the voices of our great-great-great-grandparents, our great-aunts and uncles, our cousins and family friends who had much to lose at the time but a world of freedom to gain. We work to share that legacy with our community and with our children, and I love to say that our murals have never been tagged because our young people love to see them. The, this exhibit, which you'll go and see, and also this conference is a visible example of our advocacy work about the city from saving the Nathan and Polly Johnson house, the first home and freedom of Anna and Frederick Douglass, a mural to the 54th Regiment, a statue of Lewis Temple at our public library, and now the memorial to Paul Cuffey that graces the New Bedford Whaling Museum. It has our job as the, it has been our job as the New Bedford Historical Society and people of color to raise awareness of these historic individuals and then make sure that people see what their work was about. So through our determined vision and effort, we are now in the process of creating a new historic district, the Abolition Row Historic District, which will tell the story of the abolitionists, both black and white, who lived on 7th Street. And you can come back next spring when the cherry trees are blossoming and when our Frederick Douglass statue goes up. We all need heroes and cheeros, men and women who, through their actions, provide a glimpse of our better angels. Our children need heroes and cheeros, black and white men who went down to the sea in ships, women who worked to support and shield freedom seekers, black soldiers who organized for equal pay, and others who stood up against the tyranny of the times so that all of us could share in the benefits of living in a democratic society. New Bedford has many of those stories to share. And I, I want to thank all of our allies and many of the organizations here who have partnered with us to get the story told. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, I am so very pleased to see so many folks here today, and I want to welcome everyone. I want to thank uh, Amanda McMullen and the staff of the Whaling Museum who have been so helpful in bringing this together. Uh, and I also want to thank, uh, in particular, so many of you are going to have a chance today to go up onto the second floor of the museum and see the exhibition that we've brought together uh, about the book that sort of visualizes with art and artifacts uh, and, and documents so many of the important stories of the Maritime Underground Railroad. But I was not alone in putting together that, uh, that exhibition, so I want to give a special thanks to Michael Dyer, uh, who's here in the back. Michael, say hello. Uh, he's the curator uh, and maritime curator here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. So he was a huge part in that. But, but also the staff of the National Park uh, that's here that's been so helpful in, in developing this story. Um, uh, I also want to give a shout out quickly to a couple of the student groups who are here. My own students from uh, a course that I'm teaching currently that focuses on the material of the book. They've joined us this morning. And the students from Ocean Classrooms from the Oliver Hazard Perry. So thank you all so much for, for coming today. Uh, and all of you, really. Um, so my name is Tim Walker. I teach in the history department at UMass Dartmouth. And um, I am what might be called, if we were on Nantucket, I'd be called a wash ashore because I'm not from here originally. Uh, I'm originally from the Midwest. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. I grew up in Ohio, but I moved to uh, New Bedford in 2004. Uh, but I had been here before to sail aboard the Ernestina. I came here initially to crew uh, aboard that magnificent schooner that is soon coming home to these waters, and we're very excited about that. Um, but the, the story, my, my purpose here uh, this morning is to orient us a little bit about the general story of the Maritime Underground Railroad and to think a little bit about how that project came about and, and just give us a bit of an overview about what we mean when we talk about the Maritime Underground Railroad. So if you're like me and you grew up and went to school in the United States and you, you hear something about... Uh, the, the Underground Railroad and how it 
how it worked. So my, uh, my talk this morning is called uh, Re Uncovering and Recentering the Maritime Underground Railroad. Uh, and so if you're like me and you grew up in the U.S. and you learned about the Underground Railroad primarily as a terrestrial landbound um, phenomenon, a landbound historical incident. And you learned about how, you know, Harriet Tubman and other extraordinary people uh, found their way to freedom by fleeing over land on foot, uh, using wagons hidden underneath the cargo of the wagon, things like that. I want to, um, our purpose in writing this book, myself and the, the gathered scholars, most of whom are here today, I worked to do the book with uh, with nine other fantastic scholars and a, and a team from uh, UMass Press out in Amherst. But our purpose in writing this book was to change the way people think about the Underground Railroad. Um, it's important to remember, of course, the terrestrial side, and in no way to diminish uh, the extraordinary efforts of the folks who escaped over land. But there are some problems with the way the Underground Railroad is usually conceptualized by, uh, and the way it's taught in the United States. One of the problems is that you see these, oops, you see these very long routes to freedom over land beginning far in the deep south from Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina going over land and going up uh, to free states north of the Mason-Dixon line and north of the Ohio River. The problem with that is that the historical documentation doesn't back up the idea that a lot of people escaped overland from the Deep South. In fact, it was extremely difficult to escape long distances by foot over land. The logistics were very difficult. Organizing food, organizing shelter, organizing safe houses at night, organizing ways to not get caught. It made, those combined factors made escaping long distances over land almost impossible. And in fact, of all of the documented successful escapes by the Underground Railroad, most of them began within just a couple of days' journey over land from a free state, from the border with a northern state. So most of the escapes are happening from, coast, from borderline Maryland, West Virginia, uh, northern Kentucky, Eastern Missouri, and, uh, and so on. Very, very few people are actually escaping from the far south by land. By contrast, oh, and, and historians of the Underground Railroad in the 19th century were perfectly aware of this. Um, so this is a, a map that's been widely reproduced. It's from a publication in 1898, William Siebert's book. Uh, and he, he shows, and th there are some problems with Siebert's scholarship, but he was actually very good at tracking uh, underground railroad, railroad routes uh, once people had achieved uh, access to free states. And so I grew up over here near Dayton, Ohio. I was born here in Detroit, which was an important crossover point into Canada. And so I grew up with all of these stories of people escaping over land. And I never really questioned the overland routes until I moved to the East Coast and started thinking very ser uh, seriously about maritime history. By contrast, someone escaping by water had an easier time of it. And this story, and I'll say more about that in a second, this story started to come together when I was approached uh, soon after arriving in New Bedford. I was approached by Lee Blake, who said, hey, you know, New Bedford was a really important place, a, a terminus point, a, a, a destination on the Underground Railroad, where for a variety of factors, people came here fleeing enslavement, and they stayed because this community offered them a sanctuary, a place where they could work, where they could live, where they could organize as abolitionists. New Bedford became a place that was known as the Fugitives Gibraltar, and we need to tell this story. Well, I got on board very quickly because Lee was absolutely right with that, and we started to collaborate and uh, to our good fortune, we managed to get money from the National Endowment for the Humanities and in uh, and four different times in 2011, 2013, 2015, and again in 2021, we had to postpone because of COVID, so we did it in 22. We organized uh, workshops for teachers to come from all over the United States to learn about the place of New Bedford 
in the Underground Railroad, and it was a very important place indeed. The scholarship of Catherine Grover, who contributed to our book, who wrote a book called The Fugitive's Gibraltar about New Bedford, really underscored the fact that New Bedford was a place where hundreds uh, and maybe more of people who had escaped enslavement and found freedom in the North came to New Bedford. In the course of telling this story, though, we began to realize, because we were bringing in experts on the Underground Railroad from all over, uh, universities, uh, academics, scholars, coming in to tell their piece of the story about how people got to New Bedford, where they came from, and how they traveled. And it became clearer and clearer as we did this that, um, that a lot of people were escaping by water, not over land. They were escaping by ship along the eastern seaboard. And so, after having run this program for a number of years, we started to think about why that was the case and to think about how this was a story that really needed to be told. Um, if you escape by water, it's a relatively fast journey from even the farthest port cities of the Deep South to get up the East Coast uh, following the Gulf Stream sailing within a few days, less than a week in some cases, from the far south to port cities in free states in the north. And if we look at the number of documented uh, successful escapes from the far south, almost all of them happened by sea. Almost all of them happened by water. So there's a lot of ways that we know about this. And one of the keys to telling this story is understanding some of the practical factors about life on the southern seacoast. In the, in the slave states prior to the Civil War, what was the labor force like working in the ports and along the rivers and in the offshore sailing trades of the far south? Well, thanks to the scholarship of Jeffrey Bolster, who published a book in uh, 1998 called Black Jacks, we knew that about almost 20% of the entire maritime workforce, sailors, were African Americans in the early 19th century. So right there, you've got a number of people who are both free blacks and enslaved people working on ships, giving their wages to their owners, but they're still working at sea and they're gaining valuable knowledge as sailors and as deckhands and as, in some cases, very skilled pilots but most of the work being done in the ports was also being done in the South by enslaved people. If we walked into any southern port, Wilmington, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, and you'll be hearing a lot about this from the gathered scholars today, the labor force was mainly African Americans and mainly enslaved. And what they're doing is work that intimately connects them with the rhythms and the, the labor of the ocean-going uh, business, the maritime business of America, which was the lifeblood of the United States economy at the time. There were no highways. There were no roads. And so most cargo moved up and down the East Coast aboard thousands of schooners and sloops and ships and brigs. It's being, the, the, the commerce of the U.S. is being moved by water. And the people moving that commerce in and out of the southern ports are enslaved, mainly men, but also women, working on the waterfronts and on the vessels going in and out of those ports. What are they doing? Well, they're waterfront dock and wharf workers, they're longshoremen, they're stevedores, warehousemen, drovers and teamsters bringing wagon loads of goods and supplies uh, to provision the vessels they are coming to and from the port, and so they're learning how ports work. They're learning when and where the forces of law enforcement uh, are present in the port. They know how to identify ways, loopholes in the system that allow them to get out of their circumstances of enslaved enslavement. Not only are they working on the waterfront, and, and by the way, some of these are very skilled jobs. They are learning to be riggers, they are learning to be caulkers, uh, the, the work that helps to keep uh, hulls watertight. They are learning how to, uh, to do much of the work to keep these vessels afloat. A lot of that work that's still being done on the, 
on the waterfront of New Bedford and Fairhaven today, you know, we're, we're, we are sitting in the number one fishing port in the country where there's still a working waterfront and all of the infrastructure to make that work. This is what we're talking about, what was going on in the, in the far south. But they're also working on the water, often with great autonomy. They are working uh, without supervision, uh, enslaved people who are fishing, oystering, uh, working as ferrymen. They're working on boats that are called lighters, which is what you use to unload and load vessels that are not on a dock, but instead are at an anchorage or on a mooring out in the harbor. This is highly skilled work that, uh, that if you are uh, used to the sea and you're used to the labor of uh, working with boats, that gives you a huge advantage when it comes time for you to make a bid for freedom. So this kind of labor is the strategic knowledge that sets up the possibility of wide-scale escaping from the coastline of the Deep South. And this is what we see. This is the story that the book is intended to describe and intended to open for people who, like us, most of us are landlubbers, uh, myself included when I first moved out here, that didn't think about this dimension of how the Underground Railroad might have functioned. It's half the story. It's a major part of understanding how people found their way to freedom from the South. Of all of the uh, published narratives of former slaves who published their stories uh, during and after the Civil War, and in some cases before it, something like 70% of the entire corpus of those, uh, of those narratives, 70% mentioned seaborne escape as the means by which uh, they got away. And so this is a really major factor that has been at least in the 20th and early 21st century, overlooked by historians. And our job in writing this book was to change that point of view, to, to make this history a history that is no longer overlooked. So, strategic knowledge creates opportunities for escape. And we can see that the concentrations of enslaved people, the enslaved population, is always around the ports and the waterways that allowed uh, the heavy goods grown on plantations to be brought down to harbors, to be loaded on ships, to be shipped off to markets around the world. So, uh, and another wonderful map, this is just South Carolina, but you can see where the enslaved population was concentrated all along the coast. Uh, and so anyone who's working in agricultural labor and not engaged with seaborne labor is not going to have the same kind of strategic knowledge and the same kind of understanding that waterfront workers and, and maritime workers had uh, in, in affecting their escapes, in, in making good their escapes. Now, another question is, how do we know? What's the historical evidence? Historians need to rely on real substantive data and facts to prove that this was actually happening. Well, there are a number of ways that we know about this. Uh, one of them is through the hundreds and thousands of runaway sla slave advertisements that are published in American newspapers from the middle of the 18th century going right up until the time of the Civil War. There are something like 200,000 uh, individual uh, runaway slave advertisements, and probably more. Uh, our uh, our contributor, uh, Megan Jeffries, who's going to talk about this later today because she focuses on runaway slave advertisements as part of her research, uh, she estimates that there are far more than 200,000, but um, it's difficult to make uh, absolute numbers known right now. But in any case, 200,000 advertisements, a very large proportion of which uh, mention the method by which uh, the owner suspects his property has absconded. So whenever a owner uh, realized that one of his enslaved persons had run away, one of the natural things for them to do would be put a classified ad in a newspaper to say, you know, I uh, feel that this is what happened, and I'm going to publish, in many cases, my suspicions about how I think this person managed to get away. And so... In this case, we have uh, 
This is from 1772. So 1772, um, and we have a young man named Phil. Uh, he's about 20 years old, five foot nine. Uh, he is described as having uh, a how he's dressed. But the point here is, uh, as he as he has been used to the sea he will probably endeavor to get on board some ship and make his escape out of the colony. All masters of vessels are therefore forewarned from harboring or carrying him off at their peril. So this is already 1772, and we uh, have numerous advertisements of people saying, I think that my property has escaped by sea, and we already have the potential for repercussions of sailing ship captains and masters if they are caught helping people to escape by water. Uh, here's another one, runaway slave advertisement from about the 1840s. The probability is that she has gone towards New Bedford as she has uh, a father living there. Uh, and this is a woman named Jane Pennington, aged about 20 years old. So it's men and women who are escaping uh, by water and coming towards New Bedford. Here's another example of a, a different kind of uh, advertisement. This one is not placed by the owner of a slave, but instead placed by a ship owner who has been implicated in an escape. Uh, it's a very early ad, 1797, but it follows the, um, uh, the uh, fugitive slave law passed by Congress in 1793 which set up penalties for people uh, assisting with escapes. And so here we have a local captain, uh, William Tabor, a, a very well-known local name. And he's putting this advertisement in the paper to give himself legal coverage. And we kind of have to le read between the lines about this advertisement. So let's see what it says. Public notice. Well, this was pretty standard. Public notice. To all whom uh, it may... To all whom it may... Uh, Concern, know ye that I, William Tabor, commander of the Sloop Union, sailed from the York River in Virginia on or about the 28th of March last, bound to this port, New Bedford. It's published in a New Bedford newspaper. That on the day after sailing, I discovered a Negro on board said sloop who had concealed himself unbeknownst to me. I knew nothing about it. He just turned up on my vessel. I have no, I had no prior knowledge that he was going to be there. That's what he's saying. Is that true? Maybe. We don't really know, but he's making the case that he had no prior knowledge that this was happening. It appear, and this is where it gets really interesting. It appearing inconsistent to me to return, the wind being ahead, I proceeded on my voyage and landed him at this port, New Bedford. I couldn't turn around. The weather wouldn't permit it. There was no way for me to return this guy to his rightful owner. So I had to carry on up the coast. The wind was behind me. That's what I had to do. Is that, in fact, the case? Captain's word against, well, there's no one else there to, to say otherwise. Um, maritime law recognized a three-mile limit to the jurisdiction of U.S. law at the time. And so once they're three miles offshore, the captain's word is law on board a ship. And so this, he is saying is probably not going to be challenged. And this gives him legal coverage so he can't be prosecuted. He calls his name James. Is that his name? We don't know. Uh, is about 27 years old and says he belongs to Mr. Shackelford, a planter in Kings and Queens County, Virginia. Any person claiming him will know by this information where he is, for which purpose it is made public in this manner, and every legal method has been taken to prevent the owner losing his property in my power. I've done everything I could. I can't do anything more. This is a weekly publication. By the time the owner gets this news, and he probably would because uh, uh, newspapers circulated up and down the East Coast, but James, if that was his real name, could be anywhere by the time whoever owned him uh, got the news that he had escaped and was in New Bedford. So it's important to understand this is legal coverage it, it meets the, the letter of the law, but it really didn't provide any help to the potential owner of the person who had found their way to freedom in the North. 
The other way that we know about this, by the way, this, this, this whole process of people escaping by water is through uh, narratives that are published by uh, people who had escaped from enslavement. I'm just going to hold on to this. Um, and, who, uh, and who then published their accounts later on. So this is uh, published in 1862. Uh, Thomas Jones, who fled aboard a brig called the Bell in New York Harbor, 1849. Uh, one of our uh, contributors, Morel Lukey, might be speaking a bit more about this later. But uh, he had been uh, a longshoreman and had worked for a long time in the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. And he gives this extraordinary account of how he gets to New York and feared being re-enslaved in New York because... Um, it was, a, it was a port that was not a safe port for people who were fleeing from enslavement. Uh, the authorities there were quite willing to people, send people back to the South. And so he makes his escape and, and thankfully gets, uh, uh, connects with people in the Underground Railroad and then manages to make uh, his, his escape northward to New Bedford and then further on. Uh, here's another example, a young woman, Elizabeth Blakely. She was only 15 or so when she escaped. My, uh, I am grateful to Sean Quigley of the Park Service in Boston for, this, uh, for letting me know about this story. And he'll be saying maybe a bit more about that later. Uh, he, she escaped from Wilmington, North Carolina as well in 1850. She endured almost two weeks in a voyage and uh, frostbite. It was a cold uh, voyage going northward, but she managed to make her escape and her story wasn't published until the 1920s, but we still know about it. Uh, also from people who worked as operatives of the Underground Railroad. So Austin Bierce was an abolitionist working in Boston and he publishes in 1880 his book, Rem Reminiscences of Fugitive Slave Law Days in Boston. And he talks about landing slaves at night in Boston Harbor uh, from uh, his yacht, which was called the Moby Dick, uh, in 1853, shortly after the book had come out. So it's curious that he named his yacht that. But we have all of these stories. And by putting the pieces together, by drawing together all of the evidence, we can make a very strong case that this was, in fact, happening a lot. And through the course of today, as you listen to the contributions of the various scholars assembled to talk about this process, you'll learn more and more and more about uh, the, the cumulative uh, uh, evidence that shows that this was going on. Uh, another wonderful uh, example of a, uh, a published account, published after the fact in uh, 1872, uh, this is from the reminiscences of William Still, who was a major Underground Railroad operative in Philadelphia, uh, publishes an account of hundreds of people who escaped through the port of Philadelphia, many of them arriving by sea. He talks about one particular person, um, Captain Albert Fontaine, who ran a packet ship, a regular sailing route up and down the East Coast, delivering cargo and packages and mail, uh, and he regularly removed people who were trying to make a bid for freedom from southern ports and brought them to Philadelphia and other places. Uh, this is an incident where uh, the ship was searched. There were actually more than 20 people secreted aboard the vessel. None of them were found, uh, and he managed to get them to freedom. Uh, another from the same book, uh, William Still's book, and this is un, uh, unloading people in the middle of the night. It looks like it's almost daylight because you see what appears to be the sun, but it's the moon. And I love this image because it has so many components of the Maritime Underground Railroad. You have families, and by the way, the Maritime Underground Railroad is one way that women and children could be taken out with relative ease aboard ships. Very difficult to flee over land, especially with small children. Uh, but on a ship, you were relatively safer. So we've got people uh, of color, um, agents of the Underground Railroad, who are obviously people who are African Americans, people who are white abolitionists, everyone in, in, uh, in favor of the abolitionist charge. You've got veiled carriages where you can't, the, the windows have been covered so you can't see who's inside, who's, who are going to secret these people and, and spirit them away to safe houses where they can then proceed further north and find their way to freedom. So this image for me encapsulates so much of what's going on in the, under, the Maritime Underground Railroad, 
but that isn't widely known. And, and when we think about the Underground Railroad, we rarely think about it as a seaborne enterprise. Well, that brings us to where we are today in New Bedford. Uh, then, as now, an important working port. Uh, it was the capital, of course, of whaling in the first half of the 19th century and had become an extraordinarily wealthy city, a city uh, where many of the components had to come together to create the fugitives Gibraltar. The whaling industry begins in Nantucket mainly with people who are Quakers, the Society of Friends. And by the late 18th century, the Society of Friends, the Quakers, were strongly abolitionist. They had divested themselves of their uh, interests in the slave trade, their financial interests, and they were staunchly abolitionist. And then they moved the business from Nantucket to here, to, to New Bedford. And they created, in the deep water protected port of New Bedford, uh, a, uh, a, a, uh, a hive of activity for whaling, which meant that there was always labor aboard the whaling ships, hundreds of which were sailing out of New Bedford every year. There were opportunities for sailors. There were opportunities for dock workers, people who could keep those ships functioning, refit them every time they came in and sent them out to sea. There was labor uh, needed and labor availability that made people coming from the South with those skills, it gave them a place where they could live and work in a community that would welcome them and protect them. So the extraordinary labor needed to keep the whaling ships going was one of the reasons that brought people to New Bedford but it was also the extraordinary activity of the abolitionist communities here. New Bedford private prided itself as being a community where no one was ever taken back into slavery. You couldn't say that about Boston or, or, uh, or New York or Philadelphia. People had been captured by, by, uh, by bounty hunters looking for enslaved people and sent back to their former owners. That didn't happen in New Bedford. And so it makes sense in many ways that this is the place where we are uh, conducting this scholarship, where we're conducting this, uh, this conference today, and from which the place from which we're disseminating this story about the Maritime Underground Railroad, with so many of you helping in that effort. Thank you very much. So we have a, a few minutes. I'm happy to initiate discussion, maybe take some questions. Uh, we are going to uh, have a little break before we have our keynote address, but um, I've got about 10 minutes where we can talk about uh, any questions you may have about this subject. Uh, let's start with Rufi in the back. Go ahead. There you go, brother. Hello. Yeah, one of, uh, one of the, the your that you showed William Tabor was 1797. And I'm trying to wonder what uh, Underground Railroad or the Maritime. Yes, 1797. So you get more information about William Tabor. Like. So the Maritime, uh, the Underground Railroad did not start in the 1820s. Is that correct? Right. So. We, are, we have conceived of the Underground Railroad broadly to include escape attempts and people finding their way to freedom by various means. Uh, the, the dates of the, under, of the Underground Railroad are somewhat contested. They are, it's, a, it's a matter of debate about what, uh, what constitutes the Underground Railroad. And so, for our purposes, we are talking about people finding their way to freedom with uh, the assistance of other agents, but often, and maybe this is a point that I need to make a bit more strongly, uh, one of the factors about many of the people that we're writing about is that they are engaging in a, attempted uh, flight on their own initiative, and often relying only on their own uh, their own uh, uh, skills, their own knowledge, their own resources. And so the question of agency 
falls squarely on the shoulders of the people who are making the escapes themselves based on their own capacities, which they have developed often uh, with years of working on waterfronts and then maritime capacities. But I, I take your point that, that many folks talk about the Underground Railroad as starting really later in the, 18th, in the 1820s or so. For my purposes, I think we need to talk about people finding their way to freedom earlier. And this is something that's going on from the middle of the 18th century. Uh, you know, resistance to enslavement starts with enslavement. And it's not simply a story of the United States. As my students who are here from UMass Dartmouth will tell you, uh, we look at other parts of the Americas as well. We look at Brazil and the Caribbean islands where you have a great history of people voting with their feet and leaving their circumstances of enslavement to find freedom in various ways. Um, it's been going on long before um, well, what begins in the United States. Uh, it's a hundred years earlier in Spanish and Portuguese colonies in the Americas. But this process of, of seeking freedom is really what we're focusing on. But thank you for the question. Gentlemen here, please. Hold on, wait for the... Uh... Hi, I noticed that you had, I want to say one of the public notices had a lady's name at the end, Mary. Were females... Uh, allowed to, that's it, yep. were they given position to put articles in the newspapers during that time? Oh, oh, you mean the owner, yeah, um, absolutely. There were women who were uh, legally the owners of enslaved people in the South, and, uh, and if they, uh, if they uh, felt that one of their enslaved people had escaped, they were very likely to put a public notice in the paper. It's mostly men, of course, uh, who are the owners and, and who, um, uh, who, whose names we find on these enslaved, uh, runaway slave ads. But yeah, women were known to do it as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Uh, over here, and then over here. In, in one of the earlier uh, slides, the, the map of routes. Yep people are taking um, the uh, even, even earlier the the main the main yeah that westernmost route of course mostly goes along rivers where there were where uh, there's a similar concentration of African American labor both in ports and up and down the rivers so that my, my, my just footnote is that that route is more maritime than you might assume. Yeah, no, and there's a whole other book to be written about inland waterways and the Great Lakes. You know, our, our, our scholarly effort focused only on the East Coast, but what we hope is that in the fullness of time, other scholars will pick up this, uh, this effort, this banner, and there needs to be a book about maritime escapes along the inland rivers in the Great Lakes, people crossing, um, and also the Gulf of Mexico, people escaping southward to, to Mexico and southward to the Caribbean, which had islands in which slavery had been outlawed in the 1820s. In Mexico, it was outlawed uh, in the 1820s. And so there is a southward uh, escape um, uh, system as well that is very rarely uh, thought about in, in U.S. scholarship, but which is very important. And... Um, and our book didn't cover that, but there is room in the historiography for new work on that. I would say something about these river systems, though, uh, and I've had this conversation with other historians of the Underground Railroad. The great benefit of being on a ship offshore here is that once you're three miles out, the, 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 uh, the, the custom service and the U.S. Uh, legal authorities can't reach you. That was not true along the Mississippi where riverboats stopped frequently for fuel and for water and there were numerous ports and so there were lots of opportunities where if someone was caught on board, like the, the advert that we looked about, they would just be offloaded to the authorities. And so making a safe and, um, and successful escape along the river I think was much, much more difficult than escaping by, by ocean. So a couple things. Let me repeat your question for the benefit of the um, of the people who are listening online. And by the way, welcome to everybody who's out in Zoom land uh, who are watching uh, this as well. Uh, the question was: Once you got to New Bedford, uh, could you be helped to proceed onward even to places like uh, Africa? Uh, and the other part of the question was: Could you assume a new identity uh, because you didn't necessarily know anyone in town? 
Well, I think that was sometimes true. Let me start and go backwards. Actually, a lot of people did arrive, especially by the 1830s and 40s and 50s. People were arriving because they either knew someone here or they knew about uh, the place of New Bedford as a safe haven, as a refuge. And so it wasn't the case that they arrived without resources. When they arrived, there were people here who were willing to help them. About taking on a new identity, absolutely. Especially after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, because in eight, what Congress in its wisdom sought fit to do after 1850 was to make it illegal for people to knowingly harbor fugitives north of the Mason-Dixon line. So even in free states, authorities were under uh, uh, federal um, law had to return people to enslavement. And so people in New Bedford who, who had escaped from the South, who were living here, and in many cases had been living here for a long time, started to obscure their birthplace. In the annual census in 1840, a lot of people said, yes, we were born in the South. I was born in South Carolina. I was born in, you know, Virginia. But after the census of 1850, they started to say, no, I was born in New Jersey, I was born in a northern free state, in order to, th and, and they often changed their names as well. Frederick Douglass did. You know, he arrived and, uh, and took a different name uh, after some consideration of what it would be, but lots of people did that. And, and I'll say this, because you brought it up, the scholarship of tracking people who escape is made more difficult by these very factors. The fact that we are talking about activity that was illegal and that could get people into trouble if the truth came out about how an escape had been made. And so they often tried to hide these facts and it makes it for historians, it makes it pretty difficult uh, sometimes to track um, uh, people who had escaped because of these very factors. They tried to keep the activity secret until it was safe to tell the story. And that's why so many of these publications happen after the Civil War. Yeah, Down here and then over here. So I'm Cape Verdean. I'm Barbara Burgo. I started the Cape Cod Cape Verdean Museum and Cultural Center mostly just to talk about identity and pride and all of that. I was honored to be yesterday at Bridgewater State U with the president of Cape Verde was there um, for the luncheon. And I was sitting with a superintendent. And when the question of race came up, why do Cape Verdeans not own the fact that, you know, we're an African nation now? I had to say that, of course, it's because of America, okay? So when I grew up 71 years ago, it was just like, if you could pass, because there was other opportunities, but the, and probably for another book, but this is making me think, the more I do research, the more I find out how early Cape Verdeans were here, and many that say they were Portuguese, not only they did come over on a Portuguese passport, but of course they were our colonizers. And it wasn't until, for me, the civil rights movement that you said it felt comfortable to say we were black. I still come up against people that won't visit the museum or listen to my story because I say I'm black and I did this on purpose. So now you're making me think and helping us understand that also sometimes they said they were white or Portuguese to not be confused with those who were slaves. It's still another way to separate us and, and America's original sin continues to this day. Thank you for this. Uh, I'd like to just take one final question because in the interest of time, we need to carry on. But can we, uh, hold on one second. Thank you. Terrific presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so my maritime sort of exposure is the classic Cubans getting on boats and getting out and, and doing it in mass. This seems to be, it was much more individual, as you said. They had the knowledge to do it, but they did it kind of on their own on small groups. There were, I guess my question is, there were no mass like grab a boat and go with 
50 of us. Or... Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think the overwhelming majority of escapes are done by individuals or two or three people, but there are some well-known instances of people escaping in large groups. Uh, in fact, one of them is tied very closely to New Bedford. The largest known escape attempt uh, was Daniel Drayton on the schooner Pearl, who tried to take a group of 78, 77 people aboard the schooner Pearl, uh, and we'll hear more about that uh, today. They were unsuccessful. They were captured, and New Bedford, uh, New Bedford um, became uh, a place where the captain, after serving time in prison, uh, came back, and um, and he's interred here in New Bedford in the rural cemetery. His his his, uh, his tomb is here, and it's been cared for by the New Bedford Historical Society. So, um, but but many of the people who attempted to escape, who were the uh, enslaved property of some of the top names in Washington D.C., uh, many of them were sold to the Deep South as punishment. Uh, and others had a happier ending, but very few did. So we'll hear more about that later today. Friends, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, we're going to take a, a five-minute break, uh, and then we'll come back after that. Thank you. Thank you.